As we uh, continue in our worship this morning, uh, we're going to be in the book of James and uh, talking about uh, James as he uh, reminds us about not boasting about tomorrow. And uh, I think it um, ties in with uh, the understanding that we have so much to be grateful for as a, as a people, as a part of uh, uh, people that are citizens of the United States of America. And uh, we have a lot to be thankful for, for our freedoms. And uh, in just a moment, I'm going to read from, um, from James uh, chapter 4 and uh, just remind us of what, um, what uh, James wanted us to see. And uh, we'll uh, be working our way through that this morning and then have communion here at, um, at the end of the service. But um, let me get everything kind of opened up here. I want to pray and uh, join um, Tyler um, prayed for our country, and we want to do that again. And uh, just uh, so many things to be thankful for, so many freedoms. We have the freedom to come and to worship. We have the freedom of speech, and and uh, we know that uh, uh, we uh, sometimes take some of those things for granted, uh, the freedoms that we have. And uh, I just want to encourage you this morning that that we not do that that we as Christians are the first to say, you know what, uh, our freedoms have been fought for and they've been battled over and, and they've been defended. And, and uh, I oftentimes think about uh, uh, the many wars and, and different uh, times that our country has been through. And again, um, uh, how grateful we should be as God's people that we live in such a blessed land. Uh, because, you know, even though we have lots of things we could complain about, um, there's so much, again, to give thanks for. So uh, we want to do that this morning. And um, I do want to share with you, um, uh, probably most of you won't remember them. Um, there is a couple that um, attended church here um, for a while, and they actually they sat back about uh, long in uh, where uh, uh, Lorena Aurora sits, and uh, uh, they... Uh, wanted to be remembered to us and um, went to visit a gentleman by the name of Dwayne and, and Marion Birch. Um, they weren't members or anything like that, but uh, attended church here and a uh, very nice couple. They had been married, uh, oh, the other day I, when I went to see him, I think he told me they were coming up on 71 years of marriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, he was, um, um, Talking to me, his wife has dementia, and uh, she's at St. Luke's, and uh, he was going to be celebrating a birthday here in July when he went home to be with the Lord. And uh, so I just uh, want us to remember Dwayne and Marion and, and to be thankful for them and, and uh, for their lives. And, and Dwayne was ready to go. He's in heaven this morning. And, uh, but we can remember his wife, uh, uh, Marion, and uh, just think about all the years that God gave them. So... Let's go before the Lord and just give thanks for our nation and for the things that we have to think about this morning and what James uh, is going to tell us in, in the Word today. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for this nation. I thank you for the people who gave their lives, Lord, so that we could be free. We know that began so long ago. Back at the time of the Revolutionary War and, and the freedom that had to be fought for uh, to free us from, from Great Britain and, uh, Lord, the uh, uh, battles that took place to, to get us to the point to where we could be a nation independent and free, 13 colonies that would become 13 states. Lord, from there we've grown, and, and Lord, the nation has come a long ways, and and yet we are still just as much in need of you as they were then. We thank you for the government that was developed. We thank you for our Constitution, for the Declaration of Independence, for different things that have stood uh, the test of time. And you know, Lord, there are always things that uh, seems like they push and stress us, and, and we wonder if we will continue to move on. But Lord, I pray in our corner of the world that we will uh, be reminded that we are called to pray for our nation, 
And there are people that we will agree with in politics and people that we won't. But you know, your word tells us that we are to pray for our leaders, for those in authority over us, that we are called to be good citizens, that we are called to be faithful to you first, to know you, but then, Lord, that we are to, to do all that we can to, to be an example, to be a testimony, to be a light. And I pray that you will help us to understand that today. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we'll have, many of us, to gather uh, tomorrow, maybe with family or friends. But it's a day of thinking about our independence. And thank you again that we can worship you freely here this morning, that we can open up your word and we can, we can just rejoice in who you are. I pray that others will understand that as well, that our freedoms are important. And so I thank you, Lord, for people that go through life and, and have given thanks for, for what you've given to them. I pray this morning for uh, the Birch family, as Duane has gone home to be with you, and not a couple that, that many of us uh, uh, probably knew real well or were close to, but I thank you for uh, Duane and, and Mary in six, uh, 71 years of marriage. And I pray that you will bless and watch over Marion and her children as uh, Duane's gone home. And Lord, we go through those times, and we go through those separations, and yet, even as Duane and I talked, we knew that because he and Marion both knew you, that, that one day they'll be reunited. We thank you, Lord, for the offering received this morning. We pray that you will bless it. We pray that you will bless our time of communion to come. And Lord, that we will be uh, just glad that we have been in this place this morning to have worshipped you, to have thought about you, to take your word with us wherever we go, and that we want to continue to be a testimony uh, Lord, for those that are around us. And I thank you for your love for us, that you are present here in the person of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you that, that Lord, you never give up on us. You are always ready to forgive us and that we have your love and your grace uh, to, uh, to lead us and, and to guide us. So thank you again uh, for this time and for the songs that we sang this morning. And uh, Lord, may we be a blessing to you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to read, uh, first of all, from James uh, chapter 4. And uh, talking about boasting, it's the last verses of that chapter, 13 down through 17. And James says this. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, and spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, uh, it is sin for them. As we read that scripture, and even before uh, we go into, um, into the notes that I have for us uh, this morning, uh, to think about uh, what it means to think about today and tomorrow and the time that we have been given, James reminds us that, that we don't know uh, about tomorrow and what will happen he says, you know, we're here for a little while. And I think about the very fact of, of the example that I just gave to you, and, and we all uh, can, uh, can talk about it personally, but um, uh, thinking about uh, in our lives that life is brief. Life goes by quickly, the brevity of life. Uh, Dwayne uh, that, uh, that I t mentioned uh, was going to be 91 years old. And uh, Marion had just a day or two before when I went to see him was turning 89. And he said how quickly life goes by. And you know, that's what James wanted to remind Christians of, that, that we can make plans. But you know what? And the scripture is very clear. It is the Lord who determines our steps. It's not that God is against us making plans and making goals and 
and having vision for what the future might hold, but he wants to be a part of those. And so I challenge you this morning that sometimes we forget that. We make all kinds of plans, but then we forget that it is God who wills what's going to take place in our lives. And uh, as James says, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's today that you can focus on. Yesterday we cannot change. And he says, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The scripture tells us in many places, you know, the grass grows up, flowers grow up, and we know we enjoy them even this time of year. Beautiful. And soon before you know it, they will wither and fade and we'll be in the fall and uh, those, that season will be over with. James wants us to understand how quickly life goes by. And the scripture always tells us, but it's the word of God that lasts forever. It's God's word that will last forever. And we need to cling to that. And so he says, you don't need to be arrogant about life because he said such boasting is evil. But if anyone knows that they ought to do good and when they don't do it, it's actually sinful for that person to, uh, to live that way, to have such an attitude that, that somehow uh, you can go through life and not need the Lord. And uh, let's be real honest. Um, if we are sitting here this morning and have that personal relationship with Christ, uh, I don't know how those that, that don't know Christ as their Savior get up and face the day. I don't know how they get up and, and uh, make it from one day to the next. And, and, you know, even as I think about that, though, and I've had the opportunity to minister for, for many years and, and be in a vocation, you know, calling to, uh, to serve the Lord as a pastor, I've seen the difference between people who know the Lord and people who don't. I've seen people when life comes to an end and, and uh, they grieve and they weep and they wail because they have no idea where a loved one is going to spend eternity. And I've been in the presence of people who have been put into circumstances uh, just beyond their belief. But when they've had Christ, you can see a profound difference in them. I remember when I was a chaplain um, in Sioux Falls during my years in seminary and um, had a family that they came in contact with. They were a farm family from, from South Dakota. And uh, it's kind of interesting because I've, I've had an experience of meeting someone that, that's talked about something kind of similar and uh, the Lord brought them through that. Uh, but in this situation, uh, this farm family had a young son 16 years old, took the tractor out to do some work out in the field, out in the hay field, and uh, he was by himself, and it was hilly country where, they, where their farm was, and uh, while he was out on the tractor, tractor rolled, and it rolled over him. And suddenly they went uh, from having this young, strong, healthy 16-year-old young man, part of their family, they were brought to the uh, Avira McKinnon Hospital in Sioux Falls, and there they sat at his bedside. And as a chaplain, I came in, and, and uh, you never know what to expect when you don't know people personally. But as I came into that room, I could tell that there was something different going on. As his mother held his hand, and they were sitting there waiting for the doctors to say what's going to take place. Pretty soon the doctors came in and they said, your son is not going to survive. Too many injuries internally. I watched them grieve. I watched them hurt. Because this young man was part of their family. They had other children too, but, but they just, there they sat. But you know, there was something different that I sensed when I was in that room, and here's what it was. And I got to experience that many times as I was a chaplain. Both mom and dad said, our son 
had placed his faith in Jesus Christ. They said, we know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so even though we don't want to let him go, we know that one day we will see him again. That was powerful. It was a testimony to the nurses and the doctors. They were coming in and out of that room. In the midst of the, of the hardest thing that they, one of the hardest things that they would probably ever face, they knew they were going to get to see that boy again. They were going to get to see him in heaven. That was God's promise to them. And so as we think about James's words and he says, now you who say today and tomorrow we're going to go to this and that city and, and uh, do, those, do this and do that, uh, James says, uh, you're never, you're never quite certain about what tomorrow is going to bring. You're never completely uh, guaranteed what's going to take place. And so I want to talk just for a few moments about, about what it means to uh, uh, look and understand uh, for the very fact that, that tomorrow is not, is not guaranteed for any of us. I read a funny little story this week that I thought was kind of good about a, a man who had a small diner and he wanted to increase his business. So he placed a large sign in the window announcing free lunch tomorrow. And as the folks saw the sign, they made note of it and they returned the next day only to find out that the sign never changed. Free lunch tomorrow. The sign was always the same. It drew in people for a while and it increased his business. But one of the problems with tomorrow is what? Never gets here. Never comes. Thomas Jefferson said, never put off until tomorrow what you can do today. Many years later, then Mark Twain said, based on that statement, he said, never put off till tomorrow what you can do the day after tomorrow. And some of us are pretty good at that, aren't we? Never put off until tomorrow what you can do the day after tomorrow. Procrastination can be one of those things that uh, we... Um, we do even without thinking. And you know what? It doesn't do us any good. James was not saying that we should, we should procrastinate, but he was just saying when we make our plans, let's make sure that we understand that the problem with tomorrow is it never comes. We have to live as people that live today. And so he reminds us of that within within the words that he gives to us. And I think one of the important things that, that we need to think about as Christians is the very fact that, that there are some things that we want to put off until tomorrow that are not good for not only us, but they're not good for those that, that if you will, need to hear what we have to say. Like a conversation with someone who is lost when sharing the gospel, there are people that we know that we should talk to and be talking to and telling them the truth about who Jesus is. And we oftentimes think, well, not now, maybe later. Maybe another day I will get the opportunity to talk to that person. Don't put those things off. God does not want us to procrastinate on those things because tomorrow's could be too late. We think so oftentimes, one of these days I will do it. One of these days I will talk to that person about the Lord. Sometimes it's about ourself. I will take time and get right with God, but not right now. Ask yourself, are there things that I need to deal with and take care of? And should I do it Today or tomorrow? No, today. Take care of it today. God should be within our plans. 
He sees where we are. We aren't hiding anything from him. And so to understand the difficulty with tomorrow is it's always a day away. When are you going to totally surrender to the Lord? Oh, on another day, some other time. We need to be truthful with ourselves. So oftentimes we say, you know, I'll start tithing when, when I have a little bit more. I'll teach Sunday school when, when, when things are better, or when I have a little more time. I just want to serve the Lord, but not right now. When will that day ever get here? I challenge you that tomorrow is too late. And so the tomorrow mentality is one that, and you're going to excuse me here, I'm going to sit down. Um, <clears throat> there's a passage in uh, actually in a few of your Bible I'd invite you you can turn to it even uh, in in um, in Matthew's, excuse me, in Luke's gospel, chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. It's a story of Jesus talking to those that were around him, and I want to read that to you. And I'm doing okay, by the way. I just need to, to sit down and um, feel kind of worn out this morning. Um, in chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, you can go there and go to verse 57 and follow along as I read. And I think about... Um, about Jesus and how he talked to people about God's timing in their lives. And it says this, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And he said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. In those things... The tomorrow mentality that I think Jesus was wanting us to understand as Christians in first seems kind of harsh. When I was reading through that this week, I thought, seems kind of tough. Like Jesus was being really tough on people because he was saying, you know what? Let someone else take care of those details. If you really believe in following me, you're going to do it now. And so I have... Uh, some thoughts of what was Jesus saying to us? You want to follow me? It might mean being homeless. Because Jesus himself never owned a home. He said foxes have dens or holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That was not Jesus' priority. And yet sometimes those are the things that we get so caught up in do I have everything the way I want it? Do I have life the way that I think I should deserve it or, or it should be? And I, I, as I thought about that this week, I thought, boy, Jesus said, you know what? Are you willing to follow me to the point that you're willing to walk away from everything? Everything that you have and everything that you own. Are you willing to be my disciple? and go after who I am and leave all those worldly things behind. Jesus said, you want to follow me? It takes real commitment. Because as he talked to that one man, he said, follow me. And he said, that man said, let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said, let the, bed, the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. It wasn't that Jesus was being unsympathetic. 
But Jesus, I think, was teaching over and over again, where am I in the priority of things? I think that when we read that passage in James, where is God in the priority of your making plans? Today and tomorrow I'm going to go do this and that. You know, tomorrow's the 4th of July and we have all these plans and for the rest of the year and we're going to do, uh, you know, whatever it is we think that, that, that we should be doing. Is God in your plans? Is he there? Do you live with that in your heart and mind and understand that, that uh, uh, you really can't accomplish anything unless God is in your plans? what James wanted believers to understand. To know that, you know what? Who are you? Your life is so brief that you would think that you can go and, and do all the things that you want to do and, and God isn't a part of it? Think about that. In that last one that Jesus talked to, he said, you want to follow me? Quit making excuses and do it. And that's a part of, uh, as I guess I prepared the message for this week, I, we make excuses. We procrastinate. We put things off that we know that we should be doing. And James says, go do it. God first. Know and understand that, that because life is so brief, and if you go and are boasting about different things, it's sinful. If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Make sure that, that Jesus is in the center of everything that you do. That's a challenge to us. Because it is easy to procrastinate, isn't it? I do it. I hate to confess that to you, but I do it. Put things off. Oh, there'll be another day. And one of the biggest things that I put off, I will be real honest with you, is knowing that, that we are drawing closer and closer to the day of Christ's return. And we don't know whether we'll step from this life through the veil like like my friend Dwayne Birch just did. Almost 91. Or if we will be here when Christ comes back and we will be raised up and taken out of here, translated out of this life. And you know when that moment happens, it's going to be too late, too late for all those that we thought about and prayed about and thought, you know what, they need to hear about the Lord. They need to hear about Jesus. It will be too late for them. They will have missed their opportunity. And have you ever said to yourself, oh, maybe somebody else will do it. Maybe somebody else will talk to them. Maybe I can encourage someone else who's sitting in church, you need to go talk to that person. But what if you are the only person that they know that has the message of Jesus Christ? Then I think James was saying, your opportunity. Because when we read that in that scripture, and he says, if anyone knows to do good, that they ought to do good and doesn't do it to them, it is sin. And we know that scripture. You have read that many, many times. And so oftentimes we think, well, I know what's sinful. It's, you know, if I tell a lie or if I cheat or if I, if I gossip and, and I do, those are sins. But isn't it interesting that James tells us right here in this scripture, he says, if you know to go and do good, if you know to go and tell somebody about me, about Jesus as Savior, and you don't do it, sin. And I'm not telling you this message to, to, uh, to make this a, a guilt session, but yet 
I think it's, uh, it's one of those things that, that I've had people ask me, and I don't really know the answer because I, I don't see anywhere in Scripture where it's clear, but I've had people ask me, do you think when we get to heaven, for all of those of us here this morning that are believers, do you think that we will notice those that are not there that we knew that we should have talked to? I don't know. And scripture does not does not tell us that. So apparently we don't need to uh, to uh, dwell on that. But I do wonder at the at the judgment seat of Christ, at the bema seat, folks. If we will look around and we will think, oh, someone's not someone that I knew and loved, cared about, is not here. They are not present here. All because maybe I didn't take the opportunity to share with them the love of God. I think about, and with this I'm going to close this morning. I think in the scripture, and you know this well too from the book of Acts. That Paul, when he spoke in Athens on Mars Hill... He challenged the people of that day, the thinkers of that day, with the gospel message in Acts chapter 17. And when I went back and reread that this week, you know what it said? A few believed the message. Some mocked the message. And some said, well, maybe we'll have to hear more about that again later. And there are usually always those kinds of responses. People will respond differently to us. Some will respond and be ready to believe. Some will mock the message and not want anything to do with it. And that's not our responsibility then. We've done what we're supposed to do if we've told them. And some will say maybe we need to hear more about it later. Even as the book of Acts goes on, in Acts chapter 24 and Acts chapter 26, some of the officials that that Paul would talk to before going to Rome. One was Governor Felix, and he would try to reason it out, what he was hearing from Paul, and it says he trembled. And he said, go thy way for a time, and when it is a more convenient season, I will call for you. Put it off. King Agrippa would procrastinate. And in Acts chapter 26, verse 28, it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Almost persuaded. There's a hymn that says that, Almost persuaded now to believe. Think about those that maybe need just a few more words from you to make that decision for Christ. Make your plans not based on what's best for you, but, but make your plans in your life on what God wants to uh, see in leading others to come to know him. I challenge you to that. Paul says, or excuse me, James says, don't boast about tomorrow. Because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Proverbs says that in Proverbs 27, verse 1. Don't boast about tomorrow. You don't know what a day will bring. We don't know what tomorrow is all about. Let's focus on today. And with that, I, I'm going to close and we're going to go to the communion table this morning. Think about how you came to know Christ. Did it take someone telling you over and over again, a mom or a dad or grandparents or, or a friend? Think about how you came to know Christ and how it was revealed to you. Let's make sure that, that as we go to make our plans for this next week, that we are putting Christ first. We are not boasting about what we're going to accomplish 
worldly wise and we need to make money and and don't get me wrong on that we have to go to work but you know something that that Christ will always be the priority that he will always be at the top of the list you want to follow him put everything else aside you want to do well in life great put Christ first make sure that it is Uh, Christ, that you're thinking of when your day starts and when your day ends. I challenge you with that this morning. I challenge myself with that this morning. So let me pray, and then we're going to go to the communion table and and, uh, share in those things that that we're reminded of to think about uh, on a regular basis. And um, let's pray. Father, as we think about all of our blessings, how blessed we are to to have things that you've given to us, Lord, help us to know that we have been most blessed if we have that personal relationship with you. And in just a moment, we're going to go to communion table reminder of the Lord's table. And I ask the Lord that you will help us not to take it lightly, but help us to be reminded that, that Lord, um, it's the message that not only we needed to hear, but, but everyone else needs to hear. And so thank you, Lord, that, that we can put you in our plans and, and that we won't um, just be living life in some crazy fashion of from one day to the next, and whatever happens, happens. No, Lord, we want your will to be done. And so I thank you again for this time together. I pray that you will uh, remind us of your goodness to us, And the real declaration of freedom that we have was given at the cross. That we could be free from our sin and from our guilt. How wonderful you are to us. I pray that we will stop and think about that even as we go to the table this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the deacons to come and and, uh, the guys to come and we will... uh, share in the table here together.